Good morning. So before we start this morning, I just wanted to take a second and recognize all of our band members um, because they take a lot of time out of their week. I'm talking hours, um, not just for the rehearsal that we have here, but practice outside of this. Um, and then on Sunday mornings, they get here at like 8.15, 8.30 um, for rehearsal. So um, I just really appreciate them. We appreciate them. So I just wanted to recognize them really quick and say thank you from myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> and from all of these people, obviously. Um, and then I also wanted to introduce you in case you don't know them. Because um, you'll see them up here a lot of times, but you probably, maybe, don't know their names. So um, our newest band member is Jackson. Jackson Kelly on the guitar here. Um, we also have Lexi Jackson. Kim Johnson's also on vocals. Noah Dickerson playing the cajon. And Ruben Vega over there on the keys. And I'm Deborah Sabatka. Let's jam. Okay, <laughs> you guys want to stand with us and we'll worship together.
remain standing for the reading of God's word. So this is from the NAV version, and it's from John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. And this is Jesus speaking. 
As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. And just as that song, or just as that verse said, um, there is no love greater than the Father's love. Let's sing how deep the Father's love for us. Go ahead and take a seat, and we'll move into the next portion of the, the message here.
Thank you again to our worship team and to Heidi for reading scripture for us today. We appreciate all the effort each of you put into preparing to lead us in worship. So thank you. Thank you to the people in the sound booth back there who advance the slides and keep the sound just right. We thank you, all the people that have put their effort into this morning. Thank you. And we're glad you're all here today. If you would, join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have loved us. And you still love us. It's not simply a past thing. Your love continues on and on. And, and you poured out that love when you sent Jesus to down the cross, who bore all the burden for our sin. He took the punishment we deserved and bore it for us. And we are so grateful. We're so thankful that we can know you. You've made the way possible into your presence. We can talk to you and pray to you and hear from you because we now have the Holy Spirit within us once we have trusted Christ as our Savior. And we are part of your family, and we just thank you for that. We're children of God by faith in Christ, and we thank you for that today. And so we are just here to praise you and worship you and to hear from you. Speak to us, Lord, through your word and through your spirit. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. A survey was done a few years ago by the National Study of Confidence in Leadership and uh, surveying people all across this nation, here are some of the results. 69% of Americans think we have a leadership crisis in our country today. 70% agree that unless we get better leaders, the U U.S. will decline as a nation, which I think it has. 68% disagree with, disagree with this statement. Overall, our country's leaders are effective and do a good job. But 81% of those surveyed feel that the problems we face today can be solved through effective leadership. Now that was done a few years ago. I imagine that today we'd have similar results. We need good leadership. We have people telling us they're going to be our leaders and they're going to solve all the problems. But let me ask you this question. Think to yourself, what are the qualities of a good leader? What are the qualities, what are the characteristics of a good leader? You got something in your mind? If you say a person is a good leader, what, what are some of, those, some of those qualities? So we have a little audience participation here. Somebody give me a, a quality of a good leader. It, what was that? Set an, Set an example. Absolutely. A leader should be one that you want to follow. That's very good. What else? Good ethics. Good ethics. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. We're missing some of that in our country, aren't we? What else? Servant. servant. A servant, a good leader is a servant. Jesus modeled that for us as a servant leader. Absolutely. What else? Good instructions. good instructions. Able to instruct people well and teach them what to do. Absolutely. Empathetic. Empathetic. Understands those who he leads and is willing to have empathy toward them and understand them. Absolutely. Motivating. Motivating. A good leader motivates you. He doesn't do it all himself. He, wants, he knows he needs people to help him. Yep. A listener. A good leader is a good listener. He listens to his people and is willing to sometimes make changes based on those people he's working with. What else? Humility. Humility. Very good. A good leader is a humble leader as well. Great qualities of leadership. And we look for those in people whom we elect to office. Now, sometimes our choices aren't so great, but... Uh, we, we look for good quality of leadership. And unfortunately, sometimes in America, we vote in the most popular person or the person who has, you know, maybe uh, uh, believes the way we believe rather than looking at the quality of the character of their life. But leadership is crucial to anything in life. It's crucial to our government. It's crucial to our, our local city government. It's crucial in the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, before he left, did not leave his church leaderless. The position of leadership is crucial in every part of life, 
but especially in the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to talk about today in our study here of uh, 1 Peter. We're beginning chapter 5. We're on the last two messages here this week and next week of our study through 1 Peter. And Peter brings up the subject of leaders. Specifically, he speaks of elders, and we're going to examine that and how that relates to us in life. But just before we get into the text, here's a quote from The Leadership Challenge. It's a book I read years ago. It's not a Christian book on leadership, but it has some great qualities of leadership that you can actually find are biblical. But here's a quote. It says, leadership is not the private reserve of a few charismatic men and women. It is the process of ordinary managers use, it's the process ordinary managers use when they are bringing forth the best from themselves and others. Let me say that again. It is the process of ordinary managers, that means ordinary people, that they use when they are bringing forth the best from themselves and others. And then the book begins to talk through this quality of leadership and what what it means to be a good leader. Well, let's look at our text here in in 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read through the passage and we'll come back and talk about this. Verses 1 through 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering and one who also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, right there, there was a few of the qualities of leadership that you brought forth. Now, this, the, the, the passage, he says, I, I appeal to the elders among you. The term elder is the Greek word presbyteros. You maybe didn't need, need to know that. But it, it's the term that referred to, oftentimes it referred to just someone who was older than you, elderly, or your, 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 somebody you look up to. Sometimes it, it, in the nation of Israel, it referred to those who were older and wiser, just the term elder. It later became a term used for those who were leaders in the church. As, as the apostles began to see the end of their lives coming, they went to churches and they appointed elders in the church because once the apostles died out, they needed leaders. And so they appointed elders in the churches. And elders became the leaders of those churches. So it was used in that way. There's also a couple other terms in here. There's the term shepherd, which is the verb form of poimain, and it simply it means to shepherd. It means to act like a shepherd. So you should act and do what a shepherd does, which we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the other word, he says, be, an, be as an overseer, comes from the word episkopos in the original language, which we get the word episcopal from, but it, it means to oversee, to look over people, to watch over people. And these are some important words that relate to the responsibilities of those in leadership in the church. But though he addresses elders specifically, I think the application goes far beyond that. Because in, in that day, you, you didn't have all these positions of leadership. You didn't have uh, youth ministry or children's ministry. You didn't have worship teams. And, and you didn't have people in the sound booth. You didn't have trustees. You didn't have uh, all these different ministries that we have. Men's ministries, women's ministries. We have tons of ministries. It doesn't mean those things are wrong. It's just those, that's what's developed over the years. And so leadership is a thing, something that is important for everybody in the church, really. If you're a parent, you're a leader. And sometimes, someplace in your life, you're going to be put in a position of leadership. No, you may not be the number one leader, but sooner or later, sometime in your life, you will probably be put in a position of leadership. Some of you in your job. 
you in a position of leadership sooner or later. It, you, leadership is an important role that we all play to some degree or another. So the, though it's addressed to elders, I believe this applies to all of us as we look at these characteristics and qualities that, that Peter talks about here in this passage. So first of all, he says he is a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, the one whom will share in the glory to be revealed. Here, Peter says, all right, I'm with you, and I share in Christ's sufferings. Now, last week we talked about the possibility of suffering and persecution that may come because of our faith and belief in Christ. And, and he's following up on that and says, hey, I'm one who shares in that. I bear witness to who Christ is. And if that means suffering or persecution, that's okay, because I'm bearing witness to the name of Jesus Christ. And I think this is the very first quality of a, of a leader, especially in the church of Jesus Christ, that he or she bears witness to Christ himself. Whatever is called upon you to do in the name of Christ, you do that as a witness to who Christ is. Not to you, about how, what a great leader you are, but you lead with an example that points people to Christ. Someone said, be an example. And he speaks about that later. So our lives should bear witness to who Christ is and what he did. And that's the first quality, I think, of, of a leader, is that you must be willing to reflect Christ in your life. If your life doesn't really reflect Christ, then you need some maturing in your life before you come to the position of leadership. Sir Michael Howard, who's a mili military historian, uh, found a plaque in the uh, Mariner's Museum in Newport News, and it says on this plaque, leadership is the capacity to inspire and motivate, somebody mentioned that, to persuade people willingly to endure hardships, usually prolonged, and incur danger, usually acute, that if left to themselves, they would do their utmost to avoid. Leaders motivate people to do hard things. They motivate people to do the difficult things that need to be done. There's this inspiring, this motivation, because they're doing it themselves. And leadership is not about finding the easy road. It's about doing the hard things in order to make progress, in order to accomplish something good, that sometimes you have to do the hard things, the difficult things, or even face danger. And this says, a good leader is motivating others to do what needs to be done, even if there's trouble or danger or persecution ahead. Whatever it is, a good leader motivates people. And I think someone who bears witness to the sufferings of Christ, who bears witness to Christ himself, is the first quality of leadership that we see here. He also gives the command, be shepherds. Shepherd God's people. In Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through 31, Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and he stops along the way, and he talks to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Now, Paul had spent three years of his life in Ephesus, building up the church, appointing elders, and uh, he's now on his way, and he calls the elders to meet him, and they come out, and he gives them some final instructions. He says... Now I know that none of you, none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he knows that it's the last time he's going to see these people. Therefore I declare to you that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Keep watch. Watch over the people. Your elders and your job is to oversee and to watch and to take care of them. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise to distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Notice here, these elders, he said... You're the ones in charge now. You're never going to see me again. Uh, 
my, my work is almost done. But know this, you're in charge now. And it's your responsibility to shepherd, to guard, and to watch and take care of the people that God has given to you to watch over. So to shepherd the flock. So what does a shepherd do? The word pastor really means shepherd. So elders are to pastor. They're to shepherd the flock. Sometimes we have people we call pastor, give the title pastor. But really anyone who is in leadership has the responsibility to shepherd those who are under them. And so shepherding involves at least four things. Number one, it's to lead people. Lead by example, but you have to lead. If you aren't a leader, if you're not leading people somewhere, you're not a leader. Okay, you have to be able to lead. Uh, you have to give direction. You have to cast vision. You have to bring people along to help you accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. But you are leading. You have to be going somewhere. You can't just sit still and ask other people to do things. You have to be leading. You have to be doing the job that needs to be done. And then you bring others along who can help you and you inspire them. But you have to lead. A, a shepherd leads his flock to water, to food, and to safety. That's what a shepherd does. The number one responsibility of a shepherd is to lead. That's what he did. And so a pastor or a leader or someone in leadership must be a leader. Number two, they must feed the sheep. Or in terms of the church, it's to teach God's people God's truth. It's an absolute requirement if you're in leadership. You, you, you do some kind of teaching. Now, teaching may not be your main spiritual gift, but you're teaching. Whether it's you know, discipleship, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's whatever it is, your life, you're teaching people by your life and by the words you say. A shepherd must be able to teach people God's truth and God's word and guide them through it. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to stand up before people or teach a large group, but teaching, again, can be one-on-one. -on -one. Shepherds protect God's people. A shepherd watched out over the sheep. We hear stories in the Bible about David, and he guarded the sheep against the wild animals. And Paul here warned the elders that there's going to be wolves who rise up. In other words, people who want to destroy and divide the church, and leaders have to protect. They have to watch for those who are divisive, those who aren't truly believers who come in and want to stir things up. You know, it happens all the time in churches. There are people who come in, and they, have, they, they, they smile, and they have, you know, they give, and they, they want to get into the in good with the pastor. And I've had that happen a number of times. Not really here, but other churches. Someone who came in and wants to be a good buddy with the pastor because he has an agenda. There's people who do that. They have an agenda. It's not, I don't, it's not that they want to come be part of this church. They want to come and change it. And sometimes even divide it. And some, some, sometimes these are very nice-looking people. They dress well. They smell nice, you know, and they... But they want to destroy. And so you have to be able to watch out for those things and guard and watch over the people. And finally, a shepherd cares for God's people. If, if there's one of the sheep that's injured, the shepherd is responsible to take care of that sheep, to make sure that the sheep has what it needs to be healthy. And so there's a caring part of leadership. Sometimes we think that's the primary role of a shepherd, but it's only one of the four responsibilities is to care for the people and make sure they have what they need um, for, for their life and for ministry. John Wooden, one of my uh, favorite books on leadership, is written by John Wooden, former coach of uh, UCLA Bruins, one of the most revered coaches in the history of basketball, told a story about when he was younger. Uh, in his rural Indiana County, he would, uh, they would pay farmers to take teams of mules or horses into the gravel pits in order to bring out loads of gravel to pave the roads and so forth. And sometimes the pits would be deep and they would be very difficult to get out. He and his father also did this. They had a team of horses. They would go in, load up the wagon with, with uh, gravel, and bring it out. 
He said on one steamy summer day, a young farmer was trying to get his team of horses to pull a fully loaded wagon out of the pit. He was whipping and cursing those beautiful plow horses, which were frothing at the mouth and stomping and pulling back at him. His father, John Wooden's father, watched for a while, and he went over and said, let me take them for you. He said, Dad started talking to the horses, almost whispering to them and stroking their noses with a soft touch. Then he walked between them, holding their bridles and bits, and while he continued talking very calmly and gently as they settled down. Gradually, he stepped out in front of them and gave them a little whistle to start them moving forward while he guided the reins. Within moments, those two big plow horses pulled the wagon out of the gravel pit as easy as could be, as if they were happy to do it. And he says he never forgot this time what his father did and how he got these horses to respond. And this was the lesson he learned. He says it takes strength inside to be gentle on the outside. You know, sometimes in leadership you can get very impatient with other people, right? If you've ever been in leadership, you know this, <laughs> okay? But some people just rub you the wrong way or they won't follow through and you, it's hard. But a pastor, a leader, someone who's shepherding the people will do his best to work with those people to help them become all that God wants them to be. And that's part of the care, leadership uh, in a church body. So they, he's, they're commanded here to shepherd God's people. Also here uh, is this idea, someone mentioned this, they must be willing to serve others. Willing to serve eagerly. They have this eager desire to serve people. He said, to shepherd those who are under you, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. In other words, they're serving willingly because they believe God has called them into leadership. And you don't have to hear an audible call, but when God places you in a position of leadership and you're called to lead, that's God's calling. And you do it willingly and eagerly because God has brought you and put you into that position. And some of you will be asked to lead sometime in your life. And you have a choice. Will I accept that call? Will I step up? Will I allow God to use me as a leader in his church or community or wherever it is? It's a call to leadership. And we call and we serve willingly because we know God has called us. And there's an eagerness to serve. It's not just about leading and doing things, but it's about serving. In Mark chapter 10, verses 41 through 45, uh, Jesus there um, heard, was, we were walking along, and, and the, the uh, disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. It says, uh, when the, well, actually two of the disciples, James and John, wanted to sit at Jesus' side. And it says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. But Jesus called them all together and said this. So you got two who are saying, hey, we want to be the top two, Jesus. Forget about the other ten. Here we are. You know, we're the best. We want to be the leaders. One on your right, one on your left. Let us do it, Jesus, because we're cool. So the others got mad. How dare you ask Jesus to be one and two? And they were all arguing and fussing. Jesus called them together and said this. Do you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Don't follow the example of leadership in the world. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must share, must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that was the term Jesus referred to himself quite often, the God of heaven, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He said, I... The Son of Man is what Jesus said. The Son of God came to serve. And that's your example. You lead, but you also serve. It's the concept of servant leadership. We serve by leading, and we lead by serving. We serve by leading, and we lead by serving. 
That's the responsibility. That's the example that Jesus gave us. And so there's this desire to, to willingly serve one another. Uh, we started this, this new children's ministry, Fire Up, on Wednesday nights. And I think we had maybe 10 or 11 kids this past week. And I'm so impressed with the leaders. They're so excited. Some of them only have one in their class, but they're excited. This, hey, there's a child here. We can have impact in this child's life. It doesn't matter how many or how few there are. There's an enthusiasm flowing through the leadership. They're excited to be there. They're excited to serve. And they want to see children come to know Christ and to grow in their faith in Christ. It's a beautiful example of serving. And just, to, just for me to be here and see the attitude of each one of those individuals that's part of it. And they're just, they're just excited to be there. Whether it's, whether it's teaching or just sitting with the kids or talking with them or playing games, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. They're here and they're serving because they love children. And that's a perfect example, I think, what, what they do. Leaders serve others and leaders enables others, others to act. It's not just about uh, me, but it's also about you. And so my service to you sometimes is helping you Become all that you can be. Leaders enable others to act. They allow others to use their gifts and their abilities and they support them and they encourage them. That's part of leadership. That's part of serving. It's not just about me. It's not just about the person in leadership. It's about those underneath who, who have gifts and abilities and, and can use also those gifts and abilities for the kingdom of God. There's a lady called Karen Miller. She's a leadership coach. And she gives an example about a new church plant that they had started. She was part of. Not her specifically, but she was part of it. And said, uh, she talked about one Sunday morning, she noticed this lady named Irene uh, who set up the communion table. She said, I noticed that when she went around, made sure everything was in place, made sure the people were in place, did whatever she could do to make sure that not only was the communion set up, but tables were set up. Everything was set and ready, and she just did this willingly. And she watched her over a, a bit of time. And so she spoke to her later and said, I, she said, Irene, have you ever considered that you have the leadership gift? Which Irene said, absolutely not. I'm just an ordinary woman, a housewife, and a mother. I'm not leading. I'm just serving. She went on to say that a few months later they had... Uh, a missionary come from Rwanda to speak to the church, and he talked about this, his dream to have an orphanage for the children who, survived, who's, who were alive, whose parents had been killed during the genocide. And so the church decided to hold a banquet to raise the money, and guess who volunteered to lead the banquet? Put it together, Irene. And she went and told about how Irene went out and got a caterer to donate almost all the food to, for the banquet, she went to a banquet hall and got a huge discount on the charge for the banquet hall. She got tech people to run the slides and all that, and they donated their time. Almost no one said no to Irene as she set this, this thing up to raise this money for this orphanage. And so they had, they had this big banquet and this dinner, and they raised enough money to build a building and start the orphanage. And it was amazing, just this one thing. And so afterwards... Karen spoke to her and said, Irene, that was amazing. Maybe you are a leader. To which she just laughed, realizing that she was, yes, she was fulfilling leadership. And so over the years, every year they would have this banquet, and Irene would lead it. And over the, over the course of time, this banquet raised one-third of the operating cost year after year after year for this orphanage. And so when Irene passed away, the orphanage named a dorm after her. See, I'm not a leader. I'm just an ordinary person. I'm just, a, I'm just a mother. I'm just serving. Really? Yeah, that's leadership. That's leadership. Leaders also are not greedy or seek uh, ungodly financial gain. He talks about this in here, not being greedy. Uh, but eager to serve. You don't serve because you get paid. And so some of you say, well, what about you, pastor? We pay you. Yeah, that's one of those things. How much do you pay the pastor? Well, I don't say much about that. I'm thankful and grateful for what you pay me here, and, and I'm thankful for that. But, you know, ultimately, if I had to have another job, 
I may not be in this role, but I would be teaching, I would be serving, I would be a part of the local church as much as I could because that's the gift God has given me. Um, and if I can't have, you know, earn my living doing this, I'll learn, earn it doing something else and serve where I can. And I think that's the idea, that it's not, we're not doing this to be paid. Paul even said one time that those who teach well are deserving of double honor, and he's talking about money. So, uh, and I'm not asking for a double in my raise. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, I'm just saying that, that it's okay to pay, but that not, should not be the motivation behind serving as we get paid. We serve because the Lord has called us and because we're willing to do so and follow, follow that. Um, so they're not, they're not greedy. It's not about financial gain. Abdul Kalam, the former president of India, once gave an example of good leadership. In 1979, he was the, the project director of a mission to launch a satellite into orbit. And they prepared this for 10 years. He was the director of this project. And on the day the satellite was launched into space, it started having malfunction and, and initially crashed. So Kalam had to go before the press and give an explanation of what had happened. And at that press conference, his chairman, Satish Dewan, stood up and took responsibility for everything. He said, this was, this, I was the chairman, I was my project, it, it was my fault. He took all the blame on himself, he, and he talked about his team and how hard his team had worked and gave credit to his team and said that ultimately, in the end, it, it was my fault. So, but he promised that they would get the satellite up and going. And so a year later, they launched again with a successful launch. And so at the press conference, um, Satish stood back and told Kalam, who was the director, you handle the, the conference. You stand up. You receive the credit. And so in this moment of failure, Dewan stood by his team and took the blame in failure. But in the moment of success, he stepped back and let everyone else get the credit. See, that's a leader. Leader takes responsibility when he fails or she fails. But when there's success, they let others take the credit. It, it, it's not just the one person that was a team. They stand by their team in, in success and in failure. And that's the idea, I think, of a good leader. A few more things before we wrap this up. He says leaders must be an example, and he gives this example here. Leaders are examples. There's somebody you want to follow. There's somebody you want to be like. You see a person and you go, I really admire them for what they do. I would like to be like that person. They set an example, not only in their following of Christ, but the way they do things. Because leaders get things done. Leaders get things done. They don't procrastinate. They don't make excuses when they fail. And they don't blame other people. When something goes wrong, it's, yeah, it's your fault. It's their fault. Over the course of the past few years, I don't know if you've noticed this, it doesn't matter who gets elected president. When something goes wrong, it was the former administration. When something goes right, it's me. That's not, I'm not picking on any one person. This has been several presidents who come to power. It's always the former administration did wrong, and I'm doing right. You hear it all the time. Both Democrat and Republican presidents, they all do it. It's, you know, blame somebody else rather than saying, okay, things are bad, let's move forward. But no, they got to blame somebody. That's not, that's not good leadership. Leaders get things done. They're on time and even early. They set the example. When there's a meeting or something to be to, they're there. And not only on time, but, but they're early. They set the example because they want their other people to be on time. Therefore, they set the example not only being on time, but they come early. Being ready and being prepared. They have respect for other people. They respect other people's time. They respect other other people's business and what they're doing. They have great respect for other people, knowing that when they call upon them to do something, that those people are giving and they're sacrificing. So they set this example. And then the last thing they have is a humble spirit. Uh, and we'll talk about more about this next week. Uh, was, but basically they have a humble spirit. One of my favorite professors in seminary said this one time, and this has stuck with me for a long time. He said, the day you stop learning is the day you stop teaching. 
I've said that before. If I ever get to the point where, man, I got this Bible down, buddy. <laughs> you need to come listen to me. Then I, you stop teaching. See, that's pride. There's always something new to learn. There's always something to, I mean, none of us have this down perfect. There's always something to learn about leadership or about the Bible or whatever. Be a lifelong learner. And now some of you in school are going, man, I can't wait to get out of school. Be a lifelong learner. You don't have to actually go to school, but be a lifelong learner. Always be learning something new. Always be sharpening your focus. Always look for a new challenge in life. That's what leaders do. Sure, school is hard, and I understand you don't like, but you, you don't have to go to school to learn. <laughs> you learn on your own. It's a, it's a, I think it's an attitude of humility to say, I don't ever quit learning. I may not go to school, but I'm always learning. Humility is that difficult thing to maintain because as soon as you think you're humble, you're not. And again, we'll talk about it more next week. But leaders, they also submit to others. As he talked about younger submitting to the older. Leaders encourage others. They realize that it's their role to encourage others to be the best that they can possibly be. It's not just about the leader being the best that he can, or she can possibly be. It's about helping others be the best that they can possibly be. That's what leadership is. I'll close with this final example. Claude Alexander, the bishop, the bishop of the Park Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, gave a sermon titled, Can You Do Any Better? And here's a quote from his message. There are questions that, that beg to be answered. There are dilemmas to overcome. There are gaps to be filled and challenges for you to fill them. That is the essence of the high call of spiritual leadership. There is a purpose for you being here. Did you get that? There is a purpose for you being here on this earth. You are meant to answer something, solve something, provide something, lead something, discover something, compose something, write something, say something, translate something, interpret something, sing something, create something, teach something, preach something, bear something, or overcome something, and in doing so, you improve the lives of others under the power of God for the glory of God. I want to read that again. There is a purpose for you being here. You are meant to answer something, solve something, provide something, lead something, discover something, Compose something, write something, say something, translate something, interpret something, sing something, create something, teach something, preach something, bear something, or overcome something. And in doing so, you improve the lives of others under the power of God for the glory of God. You all have the potential of leadership. So accept the call of leadership because the church needs good leaders. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that not only have you called us and redeemed us and saved us and brought us into your family. Jesus, you even call us into leadership to be a part of your kingdom program here on this earth. You gift us with all types of gifts of talents and spiritual gifts. You give us a passion in our heart for something. Every one of us here has a passion for something. And I pray, Father, that you, by the power of your Spirit, will stir up that something in every soul here today, in every person here today. If there are those here that don't know Christ as Savior yet, I pray that your Spirit will convict them to help them to see that Jesus is the answer. He can redeem them and save them and give them a purpose in life. And that person might turn to you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of their sins and for salvation. But those of us that know you and maybe you're wondering, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Lord, lead them, guide them, show them. 
Stir in their heart that something that you have for them to do. Maybe it's been a while since they did something, but move in their heart. And I pray they would be open to your leading and your guiding. And if it takes a while for that to come around, I pray that they would be patient waiting for you to answer. That you would give them the patience to wait until it's time for them to step up into that position of leadership, whatever it might be. Whether it's in the local church, where it's in their job, where it's in their home. Becoming a parent as leadership. All these things, Lord, we have great opportunities to bring you glory. And I pray, Lord, that we will answer the call to leadership because you have called us and because we want to bring you glory. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Would you stand with us? As we continue worship and song and reflect on these words that we um, just heard from the Word and from James's sermon. Um, the next song we're going to sing is Build My Life. Um, it recognizes God for who he is, and it also um, is a song that we can sing um, as servants, as leaders, that we would be um, building our lives upon Christ and that God would be our lead and our guide in all things.
today is the last Sunday of the month, and on the last Sunday of the month, um, we do what we call the Dollar Surf Club offering. So once, well, obviously, once a month, um, we just challenge everybody to, um, in the offering box in the back, if you just give, or online, I guess, also, um, if everyone in this room were to just give a dollar once a month, um, the difference that we could make in our community, um, the things that we could do for the people who are in need in our community um, is exponential. And so that's what the Dollar Serve Club is established for. Um, and we use that, the money that we collect um, to serve our community and the people in our neighborhood. Um, and so just remember that as we finish out here, because we can't pass a plate, so, um, but there is a box in the back or you can give online also. get a bulletin and look in there. A couple of things in the bulletin. Number one, I, uh, I made a typo in here. I want to see how many people find the typo and uh, let me know. <laughs> some of you haven't read it. But most and more important than that is that we're going to have some upcoming events right here. There will be a, a baby dedication on the 11th. There's our annual meeting or quarterly meeting on the 18th. And we'll have a baptism on the 25th of October. So 
if you would like to say thank you to God for saving you by being obedient to his command to be baptized, if you've never been baptized and want to be baptized on that day, you need to call me, talk to me, text me. Let's, uh, let's just talk for a few moments. If you would like to do that and give your testimony of how God has saved you, if you've never been baptized, uh, please see me. Baptism doesn't save you. It's just your way of acknowledging what Christ has done for you in a public testimony and in a way saying thank you by being obedient to his command. So if you'd like to do that, please let me know as soon as possible. All right, go forth now and be a leader for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.